Wow. 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 I'm glad he said that. I wish I said this in print. I wish I'd say it in print. Why don't I please? I beg him to say it in print. That's very useful. That's extremely useful. It's what I would expect them to do, but I don't think they ever did it. But now you're telling me they might have done it. That would be useful to put you I can check that out. It's easy enough. Welcome everyone to today's interview, uh, where we are very pleased to welcome uh, Professor Ernest Lepore. He is a philosopher and cognitive scientist and professor of philosophy at Rutgers University. His books include Actions and Events, Perspectives on the Philosophy of Donald Davidson, uh, Meaning and Argument, and in- Introduction to Logic through Language uh, with Sam Cumming, The Oxford Handbook of the Philosophy of Language with Barry Smith, uh, a new edition of which is in the works. Imagination and Convention, Distinguishing Grammar and Inference in Language with Matt Stone, and a few more. He also has numerous published articles. Feel free to add anything, but with that, welcome and thanks so much for being here, Professor Laporte. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So, uh, a few things I wanted to ask about, and um, one thing that you had mentioned that you're currently thinking about and working on I think in preparation for an upcoming book, which you can talk about, has to do with pejoratives and pejorative language. And um, so sort of as a, our first question has to do with just how we're thinking about pejoratives in the general sense. And um, I take it that you're taking it as uh, a pejorative is a pejorative because it invokes some offense or, or negative emotion. Uh, in response to it, right? That that's what makes something a pejorative. Um, is that roughly the the how you're construing pejoratives in the sort of neutral sense, or would you? I, I, th- exactly? I think I tend to start off on an innocent question, but that's actually a difficult question. One of the things that's surprising is no one in the literature actually sits down, sits down and says, "Here's what a pejorative is." You usually just get lots of examples of pejoratives, but not necessarily sufficient conditions for being a pejorative. Uh, one way of thinking about the the various theories that have been on offer. There are two kinds of theories, semantic theories and non-semantic theories. I guess one way of thinking about them is that they're trying to characterize what pejoratives are by virtue of appealing to the various theoretical outlooks. So, for example, some people think that uh, when you use a pejorative term, I, we're using mostly slurs. I mean, in some sense, the title of the book is misleading because it's uh, going to be mostly about slurs, not about pejoratives in general. Although the things we have to say about slurs will extend to the pejorative language in, in a little bit large. But... Um, if you think that when you use a slur, to, slur term, you're um, predicating something bad of an individual, you have a bad concept, it's not like Rockinati, something like that. Um, that's one way of reading it. You have to think that slur terms or pejorative languages are languages where you use these predicates that uh, attribute something negative of an individual. That's not going to work, I don't think. But So I, maybe I should shut up and let, let you ask the questions. No, no, that's good, yeah, because I think... Setting so up the, is, is the question you began with is actually a hard question. Mostly people perceive by giving you examples of what they take to be slur terms, and everyone seems to be in agreement about that. They try to theorize about what makes them a slur term. So the presumption is that they're offensive in one way or another. So when people use slur terms, they're offending other people. The question is, where, where does that offense come from? What makes that what makes that question offensive? As I said, there are two kinds of theories, semantic theories and non-semantic theories. The semantic theories appeal to the fact that we know a lot about how to encode meaning. And there are different ways of encoding meaning in language. We can do it presuppositionally, conventional implicatures, expressively, predicationally, and so on. And those, each one of those offers a different kind of theory. Even within those broad outlines, there are many different ways of, of, of actualizing a conventional implicature theory. Because people don't agree about what implicatures are, conventional implicatures are, or presupposition. People disagree about the nature of presupposition and so on. You get all that going out there. And then there's the, non, the non-semantic ones. There's the ones that Lavelle and Anderson and I talked about in the early aughts called uh, prohibitionist accounts. And then there's the ones that Matthew Stone and I talked about in our paper, which is uh, sort of, uh, what do we call them again? Pejorative uh, associations. You know, so this idea is that they're, they're uh, a tone. We argue that they're, they're, not, they're not offensive in virtue of their meaning, but they're offensive in virtue of the tones that they carry. Uh, like Frege talks about the cur. There's another word for dog. 
they they pick out the same thing. They're coextensive expressions, but one of them has a, an association with it that the other one doesn't. And then the most recent view, which I'll talk about later, is the current view that I'm endorsing with uh, my collaborator, Ola Stoinich, who's at Princeton. And the reason yeah. why this book is being written is that she and I have just finished a draft of a book, which we're going to teach this fall at our mutual PhD programs, and then publish the book in the winter and spring. The book was, you know, the other book I told you about on um, communication and 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 def deference, that book I've been working on it for years, for like three or four years. It's been very hard work. But the book on slurs almost wrote itself. I couldn't believe how easy it was to write. And that's probably why I'm more, more happy to talk about it. It's obviously accessible because it was written so easily. So that book, we I've knocked out a draft of that book in a, a couple of months, essentially. And now I'm going to slow things down and let our seminars discuss this book among themselves and among us and see what we what kind of additions we need to make in order to complete the book. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's <laughs> it sounds like it's going to be interesting. Um, so and, and there's some, some of the stuff you said there about how, OK, some people just start by looking at agreed upon examples of, of slurs or pejoratives. And uh, so everybody writes on the N word. Yeah. The N word is like. So yeah. where's the thousands of this debate? I mean, everybody begins with the N word. Some people use uh, words for uh, homosexuals. that are sort of pr right. well, prototypical words, uh, words for Asians, and so on. One of the things that's changed from the beginning until now is when I started writing on this stuff with Lavelle. Um, I don't know if this is because he's African American or not, but we were comfortable quoting slur terms, which I think is a real no-no now. <laughs> You know? In fact, in the book, we argue that quoting slur terms didn't didn't cut them off from being offensive. The quoted slur term was as offensive as a non-quoted slur term. And uh, I couldn't believe how much we quoted. So there's a guy, at uh, African-American law professor at, at Harvard named um, William Kennedy. And he wrote a book called The N- it's, The title of the book is The N-Word, but I mean, not, not the description, the actual N-Word. And it's a book about um, the, just the, the history of that word and the legal the sort of law surrounding the use of that word as well. And um, we um, wrote our article, Lavelle and I wrote our article. And at the time we wrote that article, we thought it was, I don't know why we thought this, we thought it was safe to just quote these expressions at large. I no longer think that. I now think it's, well, on the other hand, Liz Kent, my colleague who also works on this topic, points out to me that if you deprive yourself of the uh, sort of paradigm cases of slur terms, you lose that oomph in, in convincing the reader that it should go one way rather than another. So there's a kind of a dilemma. And in some sense, you got to offend people in order to make the point crystal clear to them what you're trying to make. On the other hand, you don't want to offend anybody. So I think in the in the early articles, we took the later route, the, the, the route where we offended people, which I apologize for now in retrospect. And in the current route, we're using so the slur term that we use in the current in the book a lot is mud blood, which right. is apparently a slur term. And uh, I don't even read these things, but I guess the Stoinich read them in uh, in the Harvey uh, and Harry Potter wrote novels. And we're assuming that nobody would be offended by that. But I mean, who knows? Maybe somebody will be offended by a fictional slur term. Yeah, I was going to mention that because I noticed that that you use that frequently in that uh, that draft you sent me, um, Mudblood. Are you um, offended by it? <laughs> I'm not. I'm not. Um, I'm sure somebody uh, is. Yeah, apart from that, you, I think you do mention, well, the N-word, but only in, in that way, not while not like saying the whole word or whatever. You know, when um, I wrote a couple of articles for the New York Times on the uh, slur terms, and when I got my edit, edit, editor there wrote to me, he said, you can't use the N-word. And I wrote back to him and said, I would never use the N-word. And he said, no, you don't understand. You can't use the N-word. I said, I understand what you're saying. I would tell you I would never use the N-word. We had this kind of uh, Abbott and Costello back and forth comedy routine and unintentionally. And what he meant was you can't use a canonical description in the New York Times. So I said, well, how am I can't even say N-word? That's the idea. I can't say, I can't say the N-word, literally. And I said, well, how am I going to write this paper, this this piece, the opinion piece for the Times? He says, well, I don't know. I said, I suppose it's a word that begins with an N and ends with an R and so on. And uh, so it was really difficult to write such a paper. Yeah, just just on this um, sort of framing question, though, that I was, uh, had at the beginning, it seems to me that there's like two main approaches we could have to um, theorizing about this. We could stay, say that, okay, we have this common conception of what a pejorative is or what a slur is. And then you provide that, maybe some definition for that. And then we try to figure out what it is, what sort of things satisfy that, maybe explore it in further ways. Um, or you could start by saying, OK, these are the judgments we make. These are you know, uh, accepted examples. And um, 
let's try to figure out what's kind of common to these examples, maybe to develop a theory, maybe arrive at a sort of definition, kind of working the other way around um, from cases to the definition rather from uh, definition to looking at cases. Um, and ultimately, it seems to me which which way we go depends on maybe how we're using the term or how we want to um, construct our language in a way. way. What, what do you think? I, about I didn't that? get the first way. What's the, how's the first way to proceed? I didn't understand that one. The, the first way we kind of start with uh, a kind of description of what, even if vaguely, what counts as a, a slur or a pejorative, right? So if we think that, as I um, took it that you, maybe you were doing, that a pejorative is um, something which, uh, some utterance which causes some negative reaction to that utterance or something like that. Um, and if, if we have a sort of definition like that, um, it's not going to make sense to go, okay, let's consider it individual cases and figure out what, um, of, of the, regarding judgments or about, about um, what counts as pejoratives, take those as to be, uh, take those to be sort of correct in a way, you know, and, and figure out what sort of features are common to pejoratives if we're understanding the case first sort of uh, approach. But does that make any sense to you? Maybe I'm. I think it's a very good way to proceed. It's, it's, it's incredibly natural just to say, jump in and say, for example, you know, look at the N word, look at this words, look at so on, et cetera. So I think people immediately, I'm not aware of any article that proceeds the way you do. Um, now, there is this interesting fact, which I didn't mention, which is. So there's a pretty long literature on, on slur terms going back at least to Dummett. Uh, but it's interesting because that, that line of research from Dummett to Brandom and Bogosian, uh, maybe Richard to some extent, the debate there was not so much about slur terms, it was about how language, you know, how to, how to, how to defend a certain view about language. That's closer to what you have in mind. So all those guys were inferentialists in one way or another, meaning conceptual role theorists in one way or another. They're trying to figure out what the right conceptual role is for slur terms. And so, in other words, they were using slur terms in the interest or at the service of a theory of language about where meaning is going to be inferential in some way or another. That's not how everyone perceives that anymore, right? Now people like Jen, I think starting with Jen Hornsby, people started writing about slur terms in particular, saying, look, here's a word, it's bad. When people use it, they offend people. Why is that? Why do they defend it? And the presumption from day one had always been that it must be something about what it means. They said, well, what they didn't ask them, they should have asked immediately was how, how, what, what does it mean? One of the things that's really bizarre about the literature is although there are many people who are semanticists about slur terms, they never give a, they never give a definition. They never actually tell you what the offensive content is. They say, here's a slur term. It's, it's, it's offensive in virtue of what it means. Okay, what does it mean? They don't tell you. And if they do tell you, if you go to the OED, for example, and you look up a slur term, if you look up two slur terms for African Americans, right? You'll find the exact same entry. You think that can't be right because some slur terms are worse than others. So the N word is much worse than Negro, for example. Negro is now a slur term. You're not supposed to use it, but no one thinks it's as bad as the N word. Well, that must, if, you're, if you're using meaning to characterize what makes a slur term bad, that must mean that you think that the first expression has a different meaning than the second expression, and you should be able to tell what they are, but they don't. They don't. But it's always the same thing, derogatory. Uh, it's, a, it's a derogatory expression. It's a pejorative expression, something like that. But what does it mean exactly? They don't tell you. And what they don't also tell you is what, what's happened more recently in literature, so in the last 10 years or so, is that people have said, well, wait a minute, even if it's meaning, there's so many different ways to encode meaning into language. Which ways do uh, you think it's encoded in order to accommodate slur terms? And then you start looking at the distributional facts about slur terms. So, for example, if you say to me, John's an N for some for the N word, let's say, right? I say, no, he's not. My, my rejoinder to you is as, is as offensive as your original statement. So what is that? That doesn't sound like predication. If I say to you, John is tall, and you say, no, he's not, you're withdrawing the predication of tall of him. You're saying, I don't agree think tall applies to him. But you say, John is an N, you say, no, he's not an N. You're not denying the predicational features of ends. You're saying that ends exist, but mm -hmm. or they might exist, let's say. There is such a thing as an N, or it could be an N, and so on. But So so that's an argument against predicational treatments. Then people go to presuppositional accounts, conventional implicature accounts, expressivist accounts. So the literature is more recently, in the last 10 years, has been about Tell us how how this bad meaning, this offensive meaning, gets encoded in the language. What's the proper way of doing it linguistically? And part of what you just said there has to do with the, the feature that certain pejoratives aren't cancelable, right? The idea that you yes. say, and then and it, it, it should be cancelable if if the um, 
the pejorative is merely in virtue of them having a certain meaning because you could say, right. well, I, but I'm not meaning that by it. And right. if it was just the meaning, then you would have canceled the pejorative, but, but right. presumably it's, it still can carry effect. They're not cancelable. Right. So that's just they're not, pre they're not pragmatic, right? If you, because pragmatic things are cancelable. Right. Yeah. So um, he's, he's a he's a terrible, uh, he's never punctual. He has terrible writing, but he's still a good logician. There's no contradiction there. Right. Um, well, he, you know, he's, got, he's always punctual and he's always, uh, and he has excellent handwriting, but he's still a good logician. There's no contradiction there. Right, exactly. I mean, that, that makes, that seems to be a pretty uh, damning critique of a, um, a content or semantic based account. I think the meaning accounts are off the table. Now, I got a lot of trouble with this because people think I'm a woke, which I'm quite amused by. No one's ever accused me of being a woke before, but now I'm a little more recently because I argued in print that slur terms can't be quoted without being offensive and they can't be meaning attributed. So if I say to you, the N-word means the N-word, quote unquote, means the N-word. That's offensive. And that, that shouldn't be because the meaning properties are, are rendered, um, what's the word I use, uh, inert inside of meaning attributions. If I say John, if I say the man means the man, I'm not committed to there being a unique man. That's just a fact about English. If I say but means but, I'm not committed to there being a contrast. You know, there might have, hmm. I'm not drawing any contrast at least. I'm just making a meaning attribution. So, but, but it looks like when I say the N-word means the N-word, um, that's offensive. And the question is, well, how could that be? And then, then, then some of my opponents will say, well, it's not really offensive. You're just saying that because you're woke. You've been indoctrinated. <laughs> that's a theoretical move. So there's a lot of data out there that you have to explain away. So, for example, I don't know, do you know about this? The, the, for some reason, the, the ma ma newspapers have been a great source of data in the last couple of years. Extraordinary cases out there. There's a guy who was teaching in the, I think he was in the business school at USC, and he was teaching like business Mandarin. Maybe he was doing business German, business French, but he's doing business Mandarin. And it turned out that the the word, so you want, the question is, what word do you use in Mandarin when you want to pause? You know, like in English, you say, ah, ah, ah. What do you do? What do you say in Mandarin? And the answer is you use the demonstrative pronoun. You use the, they use the demonstrative, third person, the demonstrative, that. Yeah. But that is pronounced as the N-word, the same with pronunciation as the N-word. So you begin by telling people, I'm not going to use, I'm not using the N-word, I'm using a Mandarin word, what happens to be pronounced the same way as the N-word. And that guy, I don't know if he lost his job, but he was removed from the classroom. So there's an example of where the students knew he wasn't quoting the N-word, he wasn't using the N-word, he wasn't mentioning the N-word, but just the same they were offended by the articulation itself. Just the sound made him, made him give him the, the, the woolies. Um, now, someone who thinks that this is all indoctrination is going to be very offended by this and say, that's just, that's, that's their problem. It's going to do a language. And then the question is, well, do you have a theory of language that would explain it? And I think I do. Right. And so you've, I mean, you've kind of already been talking about it, but so the, the count that you favor is, you know, this articulation account, according right. to which is particular right. ways in which utterances are made and sort of associates and responses they produce. Um, right. That makes them a pejorative. Um, I guess, uh, can you elaborate a bit on this account? Um, yeah. The first thing, the distinction, which I think I, I discovered, I, I'm a little shocked by this because it sounds like something the medieval should have talked about. It should have been around a long time ago. It looks like an important distinction, but I think I'm the first person to notice it, which is really weird. And that is the distinction between articulation and expression. So you might, partly the reason why I think it was ignored is because a lot of linguists identified the phonological properties of a word with the word itself. So when you're individuating words, you individuate them phonologically, syntactically, semantically, and so on. But I was arguing that that's not, that can't be the case, because I was imagine, imagine you had three people, all of whom were competent in English, but they couldn't communicate with each other because they didn't share an articulation system. So one spoke English, but couldn't write or sign English. One wrote English, but couldn't speak or, or uh, sign English. One signed English, but couldn't write or speak English. Okay. Now, those three people couldn't communicate, even though they all know that they have exact same knowledge of English. They all know the meanings of the words like that, but they lack a, a system of presentation. They lack an articulation system that allow them to share the language. So if you have that to say, right, that's supposed to be commonsensical. If you see that, I already see there's a distinction between the words and how those words are presented to you, graphemically or, uh, you know, orthographically or, or phonemically or phonetically and so on. Now, with that distinction in mind, I argue that it's not the expressions themselves which are being banished, 
are offensive, but the articulations of them. I had two reasons for saying that. One of which is that um, there are words, there are there are words that are not slur terms, but they they resemble slur terms in certain ways, and their usage is offensive. So, for example, the word niggardly, which has no etymological connection, none, zero etymological connection to the N-word, uh, is an offensive word to some people. It's been banished in some quarters. They might say, well, those are just ignorant people. They didn't realize it was not etymologically disconnected to uh, their N-word. No, they know. These are people who are who are fully knowledgeable about how English works, so like that. They realize that word, but they think that that word should be used because it's likely to set off bad associations in other people's minds. In the same way, here's an analogy. The swat sticker, the Nazi swat sticker, of course, is an ancient symbol, long before the Nazis came along and appropriated that symbol. It was around in lots of Indian language, uh, religions, and so like that. Just the same accidental occurrences of that, of that expression, uh, of that, excuse me, of that, of that emblem, of that sign, are offensive to people. They have to be obliterated, they have to be knocked off the face of the earth. Same thing with certain kinds of, uh, like a noose. If you see a noose in somewhere represented, you think right away, that's a bad thing. Even if it is an accidental connection between your noose and the people who use it to mean something uh, racist and so on. So similarly, there are expressions which are pronounced in certain ways that overlap with the pronunciations of canonical pronunciations of slur terms, and they're equally offensive. So it can't be the word itself, it has to be the pronunciation of the word which is driving this uh, you know, offense. And, similar, and, and reversely, there are slur terms which are mispronounced in certain ways, uh, and they're not offensive, at least not on the face of it. If I, if I say to you, there was a, there were two Nigers in the room, you'll think, what is he saying, Africans? What is he, what's he have in mind, African people from Nigeria? What does he mean exactly? I don't know. turns out that I don't know how to pronounce the N-word. I mispronounce it. You're not going to be offended right away. You're not, now, when you learn out that I was trying to pronounce the N-word, you'll be offended. But that's a different connection altogether. That's about my intentions, nothing to do with my particular speech act. So anyway, I, I use data like that to argue that uh, what makes something a slur is it's a is it's it's its pronunciation or its its presentation properties, its articulatory properties, not the, not the fact that it's an expression per se. Right. I'm not being impressed by that, but it's got to be it's data that needs to be explained. No, yeah, I think there's definitely something right about that. But a, a couple of questions: Do you agree that this makes the whether something is a a pejorative ultimately like entirely audience dependent? You know, Absolutely. Whether it's right. I think, I think well, this is right about that. Yeah. It's not linguistic. It's something. It's it's not. It's it's a, it's associate. So I'm an associationist. So that, so remember, there, I don't know if I said this out loud or not, but that I've had I've held three views. I still hold those three views, except I change what their target is. Originally, Lavelle Anderson and I defended what we call the prohibitionist view, arguing that it's not a matter of meaning that makes a slur term a slur term offensive. It's rather a question of the words being prohibited by the community that they declared slur terms, and being declared slur term means don't use, expunge this word from your vocabulary. You're not allowed to use this word, unless you're a member of the group, a target group, and of course, there's direct, you know, there are reclaimed uses, of course, of the N-word by, by African-Americans, and there's reclaimed uses of uh, gay word, gay slur terms by uh, homosexual communities and so on. Anyway, people who immediately started criticizing, saying, well, wait a minute, you got it backwards. The, the, the terms would be prohibited because of what they mean, not because of the prohibited, you know, you, you so I explained that. So I said, well, it's not because they mean I already refuted the meaning theory, but maybe it's because of the associations they have. That was Matthew Stone and I argued that in a paper in the, in the teens. We argued that there are these bad associations that are associated with slur terms, you know, the history of usage. So when you think of a language, you don't just think of the language, you think of who used these words, what, what prominent people introduced these words into the language. So for example, the the voice was uh, was counseled to declare the uh, the Negro a slur term because it was not a self-referential term. It wasn't African blacks didn't choose to call themselves Negroes. It was white people who chose to call them that as a form of politeness. So even though they didn't mean anything bad by it, uh, the African-Americans didn't want to be, they wanted this label on them because they didn't choose this label. That's, so it wasn't the meaning of the word that, that, that they, the reason why they expunged it. It was just the history of the word. So we argue that certain words have certain bad histories attached to them. And when you hear these words, those, those histories are dredged up in the same way that a swap sticker. You see a swat sticker, its history is dredged up. You think of Nazi Germany or something like that. But when you see a noose, you think of the racism that ran throughout the South during the Ku Klux Klan heyday and so on. Um, now, the reason why I, I gave up that view, so to speak, is because I don't think it's the expressions themselves 
which are prohibited or are associ associations are attached to. It's rather the pronunciations, the articulations. So that's my newest uh, little doohickey I'm adding on to the, the project, is that I agree that it's about prohibition. I agree it's about uh, associations, but it's not words that have associations. It's not words that are prohibited. It's, it's certain art pronunciations of those words that are prohibited. That's the addition. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, certainly um, the way the uh, a word or um, some expression might be made can make a difference to whether offense is taken. I mean, even for something, even if it's a matter of degree, right? I mean, and but it also can make a difference to whether any offense is taken at all. I think that's yeah, that's probably right. I, I did want to ask though: um, Is this account going to include a great many things potentially as pejoratives? So, for example, um, of course. you know, the sounds made by a parrot or symbols formed naturally oh, yes. in the sand on a beach. Very right? good question. Yeah, yeah. that's that's um, that's one of the criticisms, right? People make they say, "Look, you don't want to claim that." Uh, um, an answering machine is slurring, or uh, uh, the wind is slurring when it creates a certain sound, and so on. How do you explain that? Well, I didn't. I didn't deny that intentions were irrelevant. You know, I didn't intend to be speaking a language. If I sneeze and it, well, my sneeze sounds like a slur term, well, it's complicated, right? Because I'm not clear. So, the, oh, okay, I see. What I, I see the way of answering you. So, there's a distinction you want to draw between what causes a term to be offensive. And what intentions did the speaker use in 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 choosing to opt to use that use that expression, okay, or that pronunciation? Mm. So um, so those are different things. So for example, a child when a child slurs because a child hears a slur in the in the in the playground and repeats it, he has no idea what it means. He has no idea who it picks out. Something like that. We're still offended when we hear. It, we say, "Wait, what are you saying? Don't don't use that word. Don't say that word again. Don't say that ever again." So we don't we don't think he did something in, in, immoral, but we do think he produced an expression which has bad co consequence, bad causes of being individuals. So I want to distinguish between the intentions whether someone produces a, a expression and the causal consequences of hearing that expression being produced or used. Those are different features. So what's your question? Your question is, um, can a sneeze, which sounds like a slur, cause offense? And the answer, I guess, is probably yes. Right, but so the sneeze, like the parrot, or just symbols formed on a beach, those things could... Uh, right. Could the reason why you're hesitant is I was suggesting why you would hesitate there. You would hesitate in drawing that conclusion because you don't want to claim that they did anything wrong. They're not capable right. of doing anything wrong. I'm saying I agree with you. It's not about wrongness. It's not about morality. This is about the fact that when I hear that, when I'm confronted, it's a causal notion. When I'm confronted by this notion, I have bad feelings. I have bad associations. It's that simple. Right. Yeah, it might be, yeah, that people are tying pejoratives to blameworthiness, um, but you want to draw that distinction. You can create something or something can be a pejorative without you or whatever it is that produced it being blameworthy for doing that. You're sitting in a waiting room at a train station and some person has Tourette syndrome and keeps using the N-word. You're going to be offended. You're going to think, you're going to find out, well, when you find out that he or she has Tourette syndrome, you'll say, oh, I see why she's doing it. That will make you less offended. You say, you say, I really wish that she would sit somewhere else. You know? Right, right. And um, yeah, I guess the other thing is that people either typically associate slurs or pejoratives with um, blameworthiness, but also they typically associate it with, you know, it's people that are producing them. Um, right. It's an intentional act of some sort. But you want to say that, no, I mean, the same, if if being a pejorative is producing a certain effect, then, I mean, even if typically it's people intending to produce a certain word that, that produces that effect, it could be something else. Yes. Uh, yeah. And you go, in, in that uh, draft, you go through a bunch of different um, features that you think the your articulation account gets right that other accounts... Uh, the benefits. By the way, that yeah. draft is not print. It's at the, it was published by Noose. Oh, that's in that's in print. Oh, well, I don't know if they yeah. print. It's, on, it's online with news. I don't know if they print right away, but it's it's online with news. That's a public document. Right. Okay, but the, yeah, that's that's a good point. Anyway, it's been it's been accepted. It's you know it's in the it's online. Okay, right. Um, uh, the one I wanted to talk about was numbers. I think it's number seven where you talk about how your account predicts how absent certain articulations slurs um, might not offend. 
And this just seems really, like, almost like really obvious to me. Like, um, so if you say someone might be intending to, um, I don't know, say the N word and because they just, their pronunciation is so poor or they are incapable of producing it on that occasion for some reason or another, um, you know, a person doesn't recognize it as the N-word or as anything offensive, and they don't have any sort of negative response to it. In that case, it's not a pejorative. A pejorative hasn't been, uh, a slur hasn't been, um, hasn't been issued. Um, That's what I want to claim. Yeah. Now you can see right. why I'm commercial, because people, there's a, ten, there's a tendency here to mix up epistemology and metaphysics, right? You want to say, well, you just don't know. Well, what I don't know is what their intentions were, but that's a different issue. I do know what they produce, right? I heard it. It was right there in front of me, so I've seen it. It's, it had its causal consequences on me. Now, if I were to learn that they were trying to produce the N-word, I'd be offended, for, but for a different sort of reason, for their bad intentions, not for what they produce, but for their bad intentions, what they were trying to produce. Yeah, and I think I think this just goes, to, I mean, really clearly shows that if we think if we think this is right in terms of that these this is a pejorative in the one case and not the other, um, then... Things like uh, intent or meaning or content are inessential to whether something's a pejorative, even if usually it's involved, right? Even if usually right. in the case of a pejorative it's involved, yeah. it's not yeah. in You're fact right. essential to it. I'm making it more of a, a causal notion. So I'm, I'm assimilating it to like, like David's theory of metaphor, which is another story for another day. I should tell you this. We've been talking as though whenever you intend to use a slur term, you have bad intentions. That's not always true, right? Mm. We, for example, pedagogically or academically, I can't tell you how many times I've been in an academic context where someone said to me, you're just wrong. And in a class, my classroom, I can utter what I want to utter. And, I, and I'm not being offensive in any serious way. My students realize I'm not trying to be offensive. And I say, well, it doesn't matter what they realize, what they, what they, how they're impacted. It's a mistake. And one of the things that's fascinating was I gave a talk one time at Northwestern. It was a big public talk, so 100, more than 100 people in the room. And the three people in the room that I had in mind were the chairperson of uh, African American studies, chairperson of the LBGT community program, and the chairperson of uh, Latino studies. And they all argued that they could use slur terms any way they wanted to. And was she shot out these slur terms. And I point out to them this really interesting fact, which I only noticed after a while listening to them, is that whenever they said they could say X, where X was some slur term, the decibels went down about 60, 70%. <laughs> They weren't even aware of it because when they're in the classroom, they feel safe, right? There's like the 10 or 12 students in there that they're friendly with. They all trust each other and so on. And I'm arguing that, no, it's a mistake to ever use those words. And I've gotten some, some serious, as I mentioned earlier, I've gotten some serious arguments with people over the years, including close friends. So Liz Camp for a long time thought that in an academic setting, you could certainly mention slur terms. You have to. How can you talk about the topic if you can't mention them? I told her, you better be careful with that. You're going to get in trouble. And sure enough, there's this, um, women's group that meets every other summer with graduate students and women, women, women graduate students and women faculty, usually at Princeton or Rutgers or I think Cornell is the third place. And some woman submitted a paper which was accepted, graduate student, which had slur terms mentioned in it. And one of the one of the members of the group, this African-American graduate student, was offended by this. And Liz Camp said, you shouldn't be offended by this. And in the end, she caved in. I mean, you can't, you can't argue with someone and they say, I'm offended by this. You say, no, you're not. So of course I am, but you shouldn't be. Well, I can't help it, I am. And of course, the people who are opposition to this, who think this is a family of wokes, think that's a, it's a ridiculous, there's a difference between being offended by something because it uh, produces these offensive feelings as opposed to being indoctrinated to a certain view. So they think this is indoctrination. I stay out of that debate. I just say, look, here's a brute fact. When this term is, is mentioned or used, people get offended. That's just the bottom line. I want to explain that. Now, one way of explaining is they're, they're vulnerable to a use mention, a giant use mention confusion. It's hard to say that about the USC example, though, right? Everybody, everybody in the room knows that he's not using the N-word. He's using a word that sounds like the N-word. They can't stop themselves from being offended. That's a, that's a problem. You got to explain that away. They're not because they're indoctrinated. It's not because maybe they were indoctrinated. Actually, I don't even care if they're indoctrinated. The point is being that Something about the appearance of that, the pronunciation of that word uh, sets them off, makes them think of these associations that they associate with the N-word. Let me shut up. Yeah, no, that's good. Um, I, a few things I would 
uh, we might want to ask about. I guess one is, do you think there's some sense to, like suppose someone accepted your account here and said, okay, this is how we should think of pejoratives or slurs or whatever. And do you think there's not still some maybe purpose for having some uh, term or theorizing about um, things that are sensitive to features like intentions? Um, so maybe someone wanted to, maybe don't call it a pejorative, but call it something else. Um, right. I know what you mean. Very hard. Like intentions, yeah. It's very hard because I can use any expression with bad intentions. Right. I could, I could say those people. And I can, and you, and you could know immediately that I mean something offensive by that, even though no one thinks those people is a slur term or a pejorative term. I can use, I can use any expression pejoratively, or, or, or I can slur in any expression. But that doesn't make every expression a slur term or a pejorative expression. See what I'm saying? Like if I, I can say, yeah. I don't want to hang around with those people, okay? And those people might be Mexicans or blacks or gays, whatever, whatever group you're discriminating against. And therefore, you have spoken pejoratively of those people, but you didn't use a pejorative. So it's going to be very hard to to um, go from the person who used these words with bad intentions to these words are therefore pejorative expressions. Yeah. Yeah, that's I'm not even sure I mean, it matters much. You know, one of the things you have to ask yourself is, you know, we as analytic philosophers sometimes get in the business of reducing necessary sufficient conditions for being an X. But for what ends? What, what do we gain if we know that it's necessary in such a condition for being a pejorative expression that you begin with the letter P or something like that. How is that going to help us in any way? I'm not sure that's a question that we need to answer. Yeah, I mean, maybe it would have to be, like, I guess the reason we think that talk about pejoratives is relevant is because, um, I don't know, we people get offended and um, there's this sort of language that we want to have an account of, or this sort well, of. I'm telling you something which I know, I know, which is that there's a vast literature on this topic, vast, relatively speaking, vast literature, and no, no article I'm aware of offers necessary conditions of being a pejorative expression. None. There isn't any such thing. And in fact, the linguists who think about this stuff, or be opposed to doing anything because they think it's a gradation. They think at one end is honorifics and the other end is pejoratives, and, and there's a long gradation in between. So they don't even know where to draw the line and say, okay, they're no longer being polite. You're being impolite. Right. So um, Paul and McCready and those linguists who write on this topic, they're, they're interested. They would be dissatisfied with any account that is just, just about pejoratives alone. They would want to know what about, what about honorifics. I think this is a scale. Yeah, I mean, do you, do you tie this into a more general view of like either similar... Um, uh, features of uh, language or discourse, or or, or not? I can't, right? Because I'm I'm arguing it's not a linguistic fact. Yeah. It's a, it's a pronunciation fact, and that's pronunciation is not part of language, independent of language. So I'm, right. I'm, I'm so that's a that's my big contribution. I need to emphasize that in greater. I don't think people realize how those who have talked to me about it. I don't think they appreciate yet how radical the view is. It's a very radical view because it's basically saying it's not a linguistic phenomenon. It's an articulatory phenomenon. It's about it's about pronunciation. It's about presentation of expressions, not the expressions themselves. So I need to emphasize that more. How radical that is. Yeah. Do you think there's another sort of phenomenon that occurs in a similar way? Like maybe, um, like the opposite of a pejorative, but this like positive yeah. in some way. But well, that's what the linguist is so really interested in. Uh, we certain words we use as honorifics. I use certain expressions in other languages. Like for Italian and French and Spanish, I guess, too. There's a difference between two and uh, uh, lay. The lay is polite and two is impolite. Right. Two is not right. impolite, but it's, a, it's an informal. If I use, if, if I meet some distinguished professor and I said, I started using the two with him, that would be a bad form. He has to give me the two. He has to say, you can use the two with me. He'd expect me to use lay, which is a polite form. So lay is an honorific expression in that context. Is that you have in mind things like that? Yeah, well, the, 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 um, I guess the question is whether, um, are you giving a similar uh, account for the honorific expressions in the sense that actually, it's the articulations that matter? Or? I actually um, divorced those. and I, I, I don't, It might cost me. So I have to think that through. I'm aware of the fact that I divorced them. I haven't discussed them at all. 
And I will argue, I not argue, I just assume I could do that. But I should think harder about that. So that's an that's a area of future investigation. Maybe even in the book, when I finish it as a book, I'll have a discussion of, of that as well. I might need to, right? Because I, I mean, to talk about to explain reclamation. Reclamation is, uh, you know, people people of a targeted group. So I'm employing the term to refer to themselves in a non-derogatory way, or allegedly non-derogatory way. Right. Um, I was wondering if, because um, I was thinking about how I might approach this question of, you know, given this, um, uh, the general conception of, of a pejorative that you give in the beginning of, uh, I was wondering how, how we might think of this following sort of approach. Um, so what we have is people have um, negative reactions um, to things because because of various stimuli that they have and the effects that those stimuli have on them psychologically. So, for example, they see some symbol, um, for example, and given their psychology and various dispositions, they have some negative response. Um, why this stimuli resulted in that negative response can vary dramatically. So in some cases, it might be because it invokes unpleasant memories, or they infer some malicious intent, or they um, infer some meaning that's unpleasant, or they associate with something else that they dislike, I don't know, whatever, and so forth. Um, and so what some of the more problematic accounts of pejoratives get right is that they capture the perceived feature which leads to the negative response in some cases, um, but not all, and they get it. What they get wrong is that the others need not, in fact, have those features in order to be judged as having them and producing that negative response. So I might have rambled on there a bit, but does that? Well, I, think that's, I think that's a really good point you make. Sense? Yeah, I think it's a very good point. And in fact, um, I worry about it because, for example, you might say, "Look, take a xenophobe. He doesn't have any bad associations. He has good associations. He doesn't think they're bad at all." So how do you explain right. the fact that, in slur terms? Who has to have these associations? How many does it have to be? And so on. I think that's an open question. I think it's an empirical question. I don't think it's a philosophical question, but I think it's definitely worth exploring further. Uh, does there have to be something close to a, a, a stereotype? You know, all of Putnam uh, for for it to be uh, to, to to be in order to be a slur term. You know, is it? It can't be just one person. Like one person says, like you say, my house is. Mm red and red oh red that's a bad color word for me i have bad associations with red that's that can't be something that it can be so idiosyncratic that it only evokes one bad association of one person but you know at some what point do you say these associations don't become conventionalized as part of the content you gotta draw that line as well i think that's a really good question and i'm still exploring that i don't have an answer to that yet yeah because i mean i mean maybe at best we can say the best we can say is that for certain words or certain articulations of certain words, whatever, um, they uh, tend to uh, or produce some negative response or maybe even contextualize it further. They tend now to, in some subgroup or whatever, produce some negative response. And we can speak about it as a pejorative in certain contexts um, yeah. or more or less of a pejorative, depending on how much yeah. of the population has that sort of response. Maybe that's also, the way to think about it. Also, you see a lot of these slur terms can become, um, you know, desensitized, right? I mean, there are slur terms from my childhood, which nobody uses anymore. For example, oh, actually in the literature, for example, I have, I'll tell you about an example, I'll tell you a funny story involving it, not funny, but poignant maybe. Um, the the Dummett and, and Brandom and, um, and Bogosian wrote along this a little bit as well. They all use the word Bosch, which apparently was a slur term after World War One, for four Germans by French and British people, meaning that Germans were cruel, or other. But I don't, I never seen that word until, until I read it in Dummett's original material on this. I never seen that word before, so it had no impact on me, zero impact on me. In the same way, by the way, if when I was in Russia, teach, I, was, I taught a course in, on slur terms. Believe it or not, I taught a course on slur terms in St. Petersburg about eight hundred, oh, really? and I had my one of my uh, colleagues put a PowerPoint together of all in Cyrillic of all the slur terms in the Russian language and so on. Now I know which ones they were, I know what they meant, I know what they translated, something like that, but it had no impact on me. None. I had no associations with these. By the way, this kind of supports my view, right? Because the words, I knew the words were translations of right. these English words. Yet they had no impact on me and when I was presented me in Russian. None. Zero. Suggesting that it had something to do with the manner in which the word was presented, which made a difference to me. So on. Uh, Synonyms don't usually carry the offenses as well. 
and so on. But anyway, um, uh, what you usually find is that there's a kind of an agreement on the associations. If you ask people, what do you associate with the N-word? You'll get a lot of people, it might be some idiosyncrasy, idiosyncrasy but mostly you'll get generalities which apply to all people who are not xenophobes, let's say, about the word. So I don't know, how, uh, that's something that needs to be explore, explored more. I'm not sure it's philosophical, but it needs to be explored more. I think it's an interesting idea. But I also think it's interesting that when I look at a translation of a slur term or a synonym for a slur term in my language, it might not have the associations that I have with the, uh, the original term, in which case that's wild. That means that meaning, preservation of meaning doesn't guarantee preservation of offense. Right. And, and part of what you said there with that example um, kind of um, supports maybe the suggestion I was making that we should should maybe think of how um, whether something is a slur term or is it likely to be a pejorative with respect to the linguistic community, maybe a like a particular language, right? Because yeah. what's a slur term in English um, may carry no offense to someone who's not familiar with English. Yeah. I mean, it well, might. Happened but, in, it happened in Norway. So when, when during the Somalian episode, well, for Norway, which has been a pretty, pretty you know, Norway uh, rejected joining the European Union because they didn't want to open their doors. They invited all these Somalians in. And they introduced the word into Norwegian, Niger, which means black. So they used the word for black for Somalians. And Somalians rejected this. They said, I don't want to recall that. And you can tell how old the Norwegian was by whether they thought this was crazy or not. If they're over 50, they couldn't, they couldn't understand at all why anybody would be offended by recalling black. They didn't, they didn't think there was anything bad with that word. If they're under 50, they said, oh, I get it completely. So it was a question of not even recognizing that the word was a slur term in their own language. And that was decided by the Somalians about their language. So Somalians were deciding about the Norwegian language, so what were the slur terms in Norwegian? Right. Um, yeah, I definitely agree with that. So it's a lot of interesting stuff there. I don't know if maybe we'll come back to some related things, but I want to actually move on to um, some of your other work. And sure. You have this paper, I think from 2011, uh, written with uh, John Hawthorne. Um, oh, on words, mostly yeah. Replying, yeah, on words, mostly replying to David Kaplan and, and yeah. talking about some of those issues. Um, and I had a couple of questions related to that. I found a, a really interesting paper, first of all. It, it um, got me thinking about uh, you know the different ways in which we use the term word, right? Because, I mean, and this is something you point, point out more of an aside early on, but um, sometimes we, you talk about the word word is referring to um, you know, things with a particular sort of uh, structure or, um, uh, you know, role in a particular language or um, a certain phonetic uh, character. And sometimes we use it to refer to things in, that are individuated in different ways. Um, and that's the, you were trying to focus on the, on the latter, but yeah. So I don't know if you want to say something about, about that, but it seems uh, yeah, so I've got lots about that. Yeah. First, we'll use some history of that word, of that paper. So I was, um, first of all, I was in shock when I started thinking about that topic. I forget how I got to that topic originally. I was reading Kaplan's critique of Davidson and well, of, of the shape theory of words. And I thought that was correct. I thought that was right. Oh, I've been working on quotation. That's how I got to it. I wrote a book on quotation. And in writing the book on quotation, I need to think about what an expression was. So I started thinking about what expressions were. And I realized that literature had pretty much settled on the shape theory, uh, implicitly, if not explicitly. So if you read it in Quine and Tarski and Davidson, in the footnotes, so to speak, in passing, when they talked about what words or expressions were, they committed themselves to something like a shape theory. It was a certain shape. And I realized that, that I realized independently of Kaplan that it was not going to work. That view was, had a lot of problems with facing it. And then I read Kaplan's papers, which I think were published. I can't remember if they were published at the time, but I read them. And I thought, He's right with a criticism, but I didn't like his view. He had a four-dimensionalist view about words. Were. So I started writing criticism of Kaplan. I couldn't think of, you know, Michael Dummett one time, it was like a father figure to me in certain ways. He said to me one time, Ernie, you shouldn't write on a, a topic unless you have a positive view. I didn't have a positive view. All my views were very critical. They weren't shapes. They weren't going to be four-dimensional. I wanted a positive view. And I was trying hard to come up with a positive view, and I had a lot of trouble doing that. And I started talking to Hawthorne, who had been my colleague for a number of years, but he was gone already. I think he was gone when we started writing this paper already. We started, he was, he was hanging out in New York for some reason or other. And we started collaborating on this. And he said, look, this is just metaphysics. 
And I said, oh, okay. He said, I know the metaphysics inside out. We'll be able to write a paper on this. I said, okay, I'll do all the critical part. You do the metaphysics part. If you look at the paper at the end, he basically throws his hands up. He says, I don't have an idea. He says, I'm <laughs> here. I said, I, I knew that before I started collaborating with you. <laughs> now, here's the shocker for you. In the last couple of years, this uh, person I mentioned from Princeton, Una Stoinich, started writing on words. And she took us on. She took Kaplan on and us. And I think she devastated us. So she has a paper in, what is it, PPR, I guess, current, current, current issue PPR. Or maybe it's one of these online things of PPR. Well, she offers a theory of words, which is much, much superior to ours. And she offers a critique of autonomy, which is devastating. It's so devastating, her critique, that when I first heard about it, I thought the view she was advocating was my view. I kept saying, well, yeah, don't I believe what you believe? She said, no, you're not saying to commit yourself to that. You commit yourself to this other view. She said, oh, that view is wrong. I said, I know. That's what I said in print. It's wrong. So I was holding. So the part of the paper that I think I disagree with now is, and somewhere in there, we thought there were limits to how far away a work could to, 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 to part ways with the with the with the what we call tolerance, right? She doesn't uh, she doesn't ask you to do the demolition job on them on tolerance. The tolerance is epistemological intrusion. It's got nothing to do with word integration. And she uses that uh, uh, those criticisms to motivate a theory of words, which allows her to explain uh, solve the old uh, Madagascar problem. Remember the, you know the Madagascar problem from Evans. Uh, I did have to refresh my memory right now. So, so Marco Polo uh, learns the word Madagascar from, from Native Africans and thinks it refers to the mainland. Oh, yeah, I have heard of this. It refers yeah. to the island, where in fact it refers to the mainland and so on. So in some right. sense, well, the, 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 the reference of the Madagascar shifted from what it originally meant to what it came to mean in the mouths of followers of Marco Polo. And that looks like a problem for Kripke. Because given Kripke's view, there shouldn't be change, there shouldn't be any change in meaning. Right? Once I fix the meaning, it's originally fixed for, for forever and ever. So how can one word so if, in Kripke's model, one word can't change its meaning. You can have two words, but you can have one word change its meaning. But in this case, um, Gareth Adams brought this up as a counter example of Kripke, because you have it looks like the word Madagascar used to refer to the continent, now it refers to the island. So it's a change in meaning. So you need to change that. And given the view that Hawthorne and I advocated for in our paper, we, get, we didn't have an explanation for that. But once you divorce tolerance, once you get rid of tolerance, she saw a way of doing it. So I think if you look at that paper, you'll find uh, what, I, what, I, what I should have said, what I thought I said, but didn't say. And I think it's a much better paper than our, than our paper. By the way, I think Kaplan was being polite to us because when he, when he critiqued us, uh, he didn't jump up and down on this point. He should have. Yeah, I think um, that's good because actually this I sort of preempts one of the uh, questions I had um, that were relating to tolerance. And because you talk about tolerance ultimately to, um, or part of the point of talking about tolerance was to refute the constitutive role of intentions view um, right. Kaplan had. And um, I know something about it seems sort of implausible to me. And it seemed for one thing to um, rule out certain accounts of uh, word individuation that might be plausible. Like, for example, if we're if we individuate, individuate words by, I don't know, um, semantic role, satisfaction conditions, meaning, I don't know, something else like that. And if those things are fixed by, or at least in large part, by certain cognitive or intentional features, then, I mean, maybe the same word can be expressed by any sort of utterance. I mean, don't we want I mean, wouldn't we want that based on the multiplicity constraint anyway? I mean, yeah. I don't, it seems I'm weird to. Yeah. I made a mistake. I'm happy to say. <laughs> so, Davidson, you know, I was very close with Davidson, obviously, and he never admitted mistakes. Fodor did. Photo, but he had to make the thing that was wrong with Fodor was he had to find the mistakes himself. So, you could be telling him, you made a mistake, you made a mistake, and say, no, 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 no. And then 10 days later, come and say, I made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm, I'm more like Fodor in that regard, I guess. No, I'm more like, well, Davidson never admitted the, the, the mistake. Never, never. No, he was always right. Um, <laughs> right. But Fodor would admit mistakes. I guess I'm even more generous than that. I think I'm, you know. But Fodor saw himself as involved in an empirical enterprise. He didn't think philosophy as an a priori discipline, which we sit on our couches and think up solutions to problems. 
he says it's part of part of a scientific enterprise, I think. And I think um, he thought it was, uh, when I first met Photo when I was teaching, at Notre, well, I met him as a graduate student, but he didn't remember that. I first met him as a faculty when I was teaching at Notre Dame, my first year of teaching, and he came. And he said, what are you going to teach? I said, well, you're, in honor of your visit, we're teaching cats and Photo. He said, that stuff is crap. I gave that up years ago. So, I mean, he just constantly revised his ideas and put up new ideas. And um, I think that's a, that's a good role model for philosophers. Right. Yeah. And, and the other thing, I mean, you mentioned this already, but the other thing that felt to me a bit um, uh, like I was missing from the paper was, you know, you, you talk about um, the abstract articulations model as a one that does better than um, the other two from uh, that. Uh, well, mostly comparing it to the the stage continuum and uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, what was that called? I forget. Yeah, it's, it's Spanish argues that's a confusion as well. So they really you could go abstract or you could go concrete. It doesn't really matter which way you go. It's right, but it's you're mixing up two different issues to do that. Right, but you also don't. Um, like I almost expect, because there's supposed to be this at the end of the paper or toward the end, like you're gonna um, discuss. Well, what really are words? What's the metaphysics? And then, Either now. as you say, you just kind of <laughs> throw your hands up a bit. Very Hawthorne-esque. I don't know how to do that. Hawthorne's quite brilliant in many ways. But one of the things he does is one one of his forms of brilliance is that he's just really a data machine. You tell him some data you have, and he gives you he triples it immediately. And the other thing is he's really good at constructing theories, but he's equally good at refuting those theories. Then he goes home. <laughs> So he first, he gives, first he gives you a bunch of data you didn't have. Then he gives you a bunch of theories to explain the data. Then he gives you a bunch of counterexamples to the theories. Then he goes home. So I was very disappointed in the ending of that paper because the ending of that paper is like we throw our hands up and say, well, I don't know. It's, some, it's, it's too rich to ignore, but we don't have anything to say. <laughs> yeah, I think maybe those maybe that's the sign of a good philosopher. I don't know. <laughs> that you, well, I know it's a shock in my system. It still remains a shock in my system how few papers are on this topic. You would think... Everybody would begin with the question is what's a word? But it was like almost yeah. no papers on that topic. Very few papers written on that topic. Very you count on two hands. That's crazy given how just how uh, dominant the philosophy of language is in, in the literature. I know. <laughs> I was in shock by that. Uh, that happens often. Like when I saw I wrote a paper on complex demonstrators, I just thought, well, there's gonna be a shitload of literature on that. It was very little. Kaplan in a in a two hundred page essay mentions them in one sentence. You know, Perry mentions them in one sentence. You know, by cap, I mean that man, that table, and so on like that. Those expressions, and there's a there's a there's a presumption that you begin with the simple demonstratives, the bare demonstratives, and work your way up to the complex demonstratives, and they never get back to that. I was stunned by that. There was very very little literature on that. On that. There's certain things that you still fall into, and you just think well, there must be the best literature on this. Is not like my distinction between expressions and articulations. I just when I came up with it that it must be familiar to everybody. I started looking around. I couldn't find anybody who said it. Mm, yeah. It's weird to see these, like, what do you think causes it? People get sort of um, just, a, for some reason or another, just avoid certain... Um, I don't know. I'll give you one right now. Yeah, I'll give you, I won't go through it in detail, but I'll give you one, the, the, this, the other book, the, the deeper book, the harder book, is predicated on. So here's two views that are, part of the folklore, right? I mean, they're part of our philosophical lore. One is from the 70s, which created, the, you know, the Putnam, they, Kripke, Putnam, Kaplan, Burge revolution, mm -hmm. which is that, um, well, externalism is they had in mind, but I have in mind more like deference, that a lot of language use is built on deference. That people are, well, basically the idea that people can be very confused and, in, and and ignorant about the, the reference of their expressions or the, what those expressions are true of, and still be competent in using them, right? So I can be very I, I might think Gödel was uh, a logician. In fact, he really wasn't a logician. Uh, but it doesn't mean I can't say Gödel was a logician or Gödel wasn't a logician. So I'm not saying is anything appropriate. On the other hand, go ahead. Does that have to do with division of like linguistic labor? That's the same sort of thing. Right? Yeah. Or yeah. So you have deference to, to the experts in some ways or other. On the other hand, you have the Gricean picture about language communication. And that stayed intact. So the idea is that when you communicate with someone, you're, you have a communicative intention. You're trying to get that person to retrieve your intention. 
however way you put it in language and the conventionalize it in language, you know the if you like, you know the uh, the coding system for coding your thought into that language. If that person you're talking to knows how to decode it, I, uh, is it and he speaks the same language as you, they'll be able to fit, retrieve your thought. And that's the goal of language. So the idea that in communication we're trying to share our thoughts. That goes back forever and ever. It goes back to at least John Locke. Maybe, maybe probably back to Plato. Who knows? And then on the other hand, this is a very exciting idea from the 70s that people can be very ignorant and mistaken about their language and yet still be, be able to use it effectively and correctly. Here's the question. How do you put those two together? You may think, you think that must be the first question anybody would ask themselves when they come up with these views. No one ever asked it. Nobody ever asked that question. I'm in shock that no one ever asked that question. I wrote a whole book of trying to answer why they didn't answer that question. Because on a prima facie, it looks like you've got a, you got a, you got an immovable object, you know, an irresistible force. You know, you just think something's got to give here. So let me make sure you're clear about that, right? According to the standard model that comes down to us from Kripke, I can be vastly ignorant about what I'm talking about and still be able to talk about it. Right? I could, I have all sorts of false beliefs or incomplete beliefs. About, about what I'm picking out with my language and still successfully pick out. So I can say, who's Girdle? I'm using Girdle, I'm not quoting Girdle, I'm quote using Girdle. I'm using the name Girdle in that context and there's no problem with that. So there's that one thing, and, then, and then the idea is that I defer to someone. So somebody is supposed to know exactly how who Girdle is. That's even an open question, by the way. That's, that's not obvious, right? Because you have this discussion of water natural kind terms in Putnam. Yeah. You know, we could, in the 18th century, no one had a clue what water was. So there's no way to defer to it. You could defer to a future scientist, but that's bizarre, right? You know, I'm referring to some, so you mean the word doesn't have a meaning until the future comes into existence? I don't know exactly, but that's the case. And anyway, we have this view that people can speak language appropriately, even though they're wrong about their language or, or ignorant about their language. But on the other hand, you have this view that says, you can use language to communicate your thoughts. No one's denying you have thoughts. I have these thoughts. I want to communicate them. I put them in the language, and then you uh, decode them and take them out of language, put back in the thought. Those two views, I think, are two giant views in philosophy of language, and they're not obviously compatible. Because, if, for example, if you really believe, if you take deference seriously, you ask yourself, why did you choose to use that word? You don't even know what it means. Why did you choose to use it? Why did you choose the word? Why you pick one word over another? You have some false police about what the word means, but that's not a good enough excuse. Why do we succeed in getting, so I ask you for a glass of water and you give me a glass of water. How come I succeed in doing that? Because you don't know what water is, I don't know what water is. So how do I even know how, what to get you? Why, why do I choose the word I choose? Why do you recognize the word and, and know what to do to, to satisfy it? So it's not, the obvious answer is because I know what the words mean. But the point being is that the lesson of the 70s was, no, you don't, you don't know what the words mean. So you think, okay, Rice's project is, is, is predicated on people know what language means and they know how to communicate. Kripke's project is predicated on social people who don't know what words mean. Why didn't those projects run into each other? And think about Stonecker. Stonecker is, mm -hmm. a, is, is as big an externalist as anyone I know, and yet he's a Gricean. His whole theory of communication is, is, is right. And I'll tell you, he's a Gricean. So it looks to me like Rice and Kripke are not compatible. So you had to explain how that's possible. What, what, what do you do, given that it's not? What did anyone do? Did anyone do anything about it? Well, Putnam did, right? Putnam had stereotypes. They were around. Other people had uh, sort of like Higginbotham talks about analyticity that so you have to have in order to lower language, thematic roles, and things like that sort. But none of them works. So the book is going to be to lay out the, the first view, the Kripke view, in, in explicit detail in the first half. In the second half, to go through possible solutions. I mean, to lay out the Kripke view and the, and the Grice view in the first half, and then the second half of the book is to go through the possible solutions, stereotypes, conceptual roles. There's a, one of the things I'm finding interesting right now is that the Hasslinger, Ludlow, uh, Plunkett, Sundell, I don't know how much of this literature you know, that, that view about um, negotiation or amelioration, that's a way of answering this. They're saying you don't even know anything in advance. You don't need to know what the words mean in advance. You can make a meaning up on the spot to communicate. So Hasslinger and Ludlow and Plunkett and Sundell and Herman Capel and so on. They're all offering these theories of language which suggest that we make up meanings on the fly. That's, do you know this stuff? Do you know this literature at all? It's very- Yeah, a little bit. It's, it's interesting. It's very, it's very hot right now. So for example, the famous example that Ludlow likes to use, the, the Secretariat, which is appropriate right now, watching the Olympics. So there was a, ASPN had a, some kind of contest to pick out the, the greatest athletes of the 20th century. And Secretariat came in 12th. And everybody said, ah, what? It's a horse. <laughs> How could a horse be an athlete? 
you know, and there was a debate, or Pluto, right? Was Pluto a planet or not a planet, so on. So the sense in which they make up these meanings on the spot. So they changed the meaning so that Seneca became part of the meaning of, part of the extension of uh, athlete. They changed the meaning so that Pluto is no longer a planet, and so on, and so on. So you might think, well, that will help you. That requires a no prior knowledge of meaning. So Kripke and Putnam and Burge and Kaplan and then Fodor and so on, all saying there's no prior knowledge of meaning. Oh, yeah, we agree with that. But that doesn't mean you can't make up meaning on the spot. I argue that view's not going to work either. Yeah, because that seems to almost to make um, meaning too malleable in a way, right? Like, well, you're exactly right. What I argue yeah. is that you can't you can't coordinate on those things that they're calling meanings. They're not meanings. Whatever those things are, they can't be meanings. Meanings require coordination. All Lewis, and that, you don't have that with these made up things. Right. There's too um, much indeterminacy. Yeah, I think. I mean, on its face, that seems that seems like the right, right response to me. But it seems there's going to be a bunch of literature to explore. Right? A lot so, of literature. Yeah. Lot of, <laughs> and there, there's a lot, of, a lot of our uh, you know sacred cows. So I got to be very careful of what I have to say there. Right, right. I do want to ask some questions about more about language and externalism. But I do want did I did have one more question about that on words paper, and then we can move oh, on. So. Yeah. Um, and this is sort of in, maybe in defense of. Um, Alex, I don't take the view, but Kaplan's what do you call it? Uh, what do you call that stage theoretic view? Oh, um, for the yeah. Or what's the stage theoretic view? It's the. Uh, it's a, it's a, the I call it four-dimensionalism. Stage continuant view. Yeah, that's a, a four dimension. It's the same. Yeah, it's it's a four-dimensional object in a sense. Where words are composed of. Uh, yeah. Uh, individual utterances, um, and um, and I think one one of the criticisms you have. Um, of that view is that it seems to give words the, the wrong sort of modal profile. Because um, right. like had... We we'll cover our asses though. We do say that you might be able to do some kind of Lewisian counterpart thing. We don't rule that out a priori. Yeah. It's going to be complicated. Yeah, though I was thinking that um, what if someone were to deny... Because like, what you want to say is something like, oh, if, if, if this utterance or those parts of the word, whatever, so to speak, had not existed, then the word would not have existed. Um, but what if we deny that the, um, you know, in the case of this word, the identity is its constitution, right? What if we, the identity criteria for counting as that word is um, not just what utterances um, compose it, in other words? What if right. we, is that a, maybe some way? Well, someone I think go? in the paper, I, I may have missed, I missed, I missed, it's been a while. That paper actually was written in the OATS, but Kaplan commenting on that paper at the Pacific APA meeting, and JP offered to publish his reply to us in our paper, and we had to wait for his reply. It took three years for the reply. And Hawthorne kept saying, let's just publish it. I said, are you kidding me? We'll have David Kaplan replying to us in print? I'll wait. Um, so the paper goes back a long while. It's probably 15 years ago now, so I got to remember it. But I think what we do is we consider that view. Don't we consider that view you're describing? Like the view that we use that as a criticism of Kaplan. That you can create words that are never, we we argue that you can create words that have never been yeah. announced. So Kaplan can't be right. Yeah, yeah. That that other, um, I think that was a second criticism. I, I I don't know. When I read it, I took it that as a different criticism where you say that like, well, whatever we say here, if there's no performances of the word, then the word doesn't exist because you know if if it's just a composite of those parts and there's none of those parts, then it can't exist. That seems right to me. Um, but this question was just on whether you could, the same word could exist if, you know, the utterances were a bit different or, um, I see. Yeah. Well, that's, that's an open question. I mean, I don't rule it out a priori, but you got to give me a, a theory that that's compatible with Kaplan. So you're imagining some modal story that you could tell building, is it like a, a, a Quinean Lewisian view of modality where you have all the parts exist, actually exist in this world, you're putting them together in different ways? Well, no, the, the idea is that like um, the identity criteria for, you know, counting as that word aren't so strict as to specify the entire uh, constitution or composition of it. Um, so that it could have a somewhat different composition, but still count as the same word, still satisfy those identity criteria. But maybe I, that's. I think that's an interesting idea, but you have to do some work. It doesn't doesn't sound Kaplanian immediately. It sounds anti-Kaplanian. 
Yeah, I think that's probably right. I mean, even if this, even if you could give something that gives the right sort of modal profile, the question is, okay, what are the criteria for um, counting as that word, if, if not having the utterances and right, exactly. that are in fact, yeah. I agree with that, yeah. It still well, leaves, it maybe like brings up more questions. Anyway. As you and I talk about this, I realize that's an interesting topic. Why have more people been interested in it? I don't get it. I'm puzzling. Right. I do think um, that your skepticism of, of this, I don't know, four dimensional view of the word seems kind of, seems to me pretty strange. Um, I'm, I'm against four dimensionals in general. So, <laughs> right. Or, right. I mean, if you don't think there are any, any four dimensional objects, or if you don't think that's a good way to think about objects in general, then um, you're going to be skeptical in this case. Too. Um, I was really. Um, by the fact that Kaplan thought Kripke had to be a four dimensionalist, that, that was puzzling. Yeah, I don't, I never got that sense reading Kripke, but uh, um, yeah, I really oh, you should definitely look at the Soyanch paper, though. I think you'll find that really fascinating. It's much more readable than our paper. And I think you'll wind up reading with all the points she makes. It's very, it's very hostile paper. No, it's, a, it's respectful, but it's very critical. All right. I mean, that's that's good. I mean, I, um, I still think it's a, a a good paper overall. I mean, it's definitely a lot of interesting things brought up there, and reason even the if there's some things that uh, that maybe weren't quite right. By the way, you know what's interesting is there's still people out there in the face of all those criticisms. There's still a number of people out there that are still shape theorists. It blows my mind. I don't know how you can be a shape theorist, but Capellan, Capellan still thinks that the wind can write a sentence on the on the sand and the beach. So is White. Wow. I don't know what he's thinking, but that's what he thinks. I just don't understand that in the sense that, like, clearly we have a sense of word. Um, okay, there's some sense of word that we have that might be, that that might satisfy. But the sense in, in, of word in which, say, pleu and rain are the same word, you know, even though one's in French and one's in English, that's the sense in which we use word. And that's the one that's being discussed here, right? So uh, it can't just be the shape of it, I don't know. Well, yeah, I agree with you. Anyway. But I think well, there's a people, though. I think Milken holds a shape view, uh, Capellan, maybe Burge. I'm not even sure if Burge held one. Of them. I don't know. I, I reference a bunch of people in the papers. You can find it there. And how do you compare the shape view? How do you make sense of it? I guess I didn't, you know, people are going to say some complicated things, but how, how do you maintain a shape view when words aren't necessarily shaped? What if it sounds? What if it's hands? Well, that's what I said. How does that so, you, know, you know, a little abstraction, which is absurd. There's going to be some level of abstraction where the shape could include the sound, smoke signals, all those things could be the same shape. You think, oh, wait a minute. Right. Then your description of the quote unquote shape is maybe this long disjunction of different possible sorts of um, physical signs or something. Um, I don't know. I mean, uh, Gabe Greenberg has his views on, on maps. Maybe he can use some of that where you talk about isomorphisms. Like, why does something a map of something else? What does it have to share in common for the A to be a map of B? Hmm. And he agrees that things that look very different could be saying the same map, could be mapping the same thing. You say, well, how is that possible? How can they both be a map of the same thing? They're so different. And he has, he offers some kind of isomorphic view. I don't remember it exactly, but it's very formal. I think that paper was in Phil Review, but I'm not sure. Right. Uh, all right. I mean, it was interesting to read anyway. Um, uh, so any, I want to, you started talking briefly about um, uh, externalism, semantics, externalism, and some related things in positive language. Yeah. And um, I guess just in general, what, um, you know, externalism to varying degrees has become um, pretty standard in philosophy, largely because of um, Putnam, Burge, I guess Kripke, and, um, and others. Um, What's your take on this matter? Are you as convinced as some of the more radical externalists that you mentioned? Like I'm taking a take. In other words, I'm taking a view that says, look, here's two views. I thought, you know, for many years, for two years, I wrote this book thinking I was writing about externalism. I'm not. I'm writing about deference, which is independent of externalism. Because even Gareth Evans was a deferential person. Putin, uh, uh, the other person I'm aware of who in print says even deference is wrong is Putin, is uh, uh, Dummett. Dummett says that you, you can't defer to a tape recorder or remember he says that things it's not enough. But anyway, Evans points out that 
on nicotine and aluminum and so on that I defer. But what he thought was he was still some kind of internalist because he thought he was a neophragian because he thought that the, somebody had to have some content in mind. That's enough of me to make my case. My case is compatible with maybe externalism is false. Because externalism is not only just about chains, but it's also about the first step. What happens at the first step? When the guy is uh, neologizing, does he have to have a content in mind? Something like that. That's whether you're externalism. So I don't care about that stage. I'm, I'm saying whatever happens, I'm a realist on meaning. I'm saying whatever happens, happens. Maybe it's internalist, maybe it's externalist. I don't know. I don't care. What I care about is the fact that everybody concedes except for Dummett, that there's a degree of deference involved in the use of language, that I don't know the meanings of all the expressions I use. Sometimes I use expressions which I'm not really clear. Like, I have no idea how to pick out aluminum. Experts tell me what's aluminum. I don't know how to pick out nicotine. Experts tell me what's nicotine. Nicotine's that stuff in cigarettes. Aluminum is some kind of metal. That's all I can say to tell you about. It. Yet I can use those words successfully. So that's, that's a difference. Now, deference in the literature, the published literature, is very psychologically driven. So when Putnam talks about, or Kripke even, when Kripke talks about deference, he's, it's about an intention in that form. As a speaker, I intend to pick out what you picked out when you used the expression. So you're my, you're the progenitor. You gave me the word. You neologized the word. I picked it up from you. So what do I pick out? Well, I intend to pick out what you intend to pick out. I'm giving up that idea. So deference for me is more of a causal notion. So what I'm assuming is that when someone speaks, words are used, and those words go into my mental lexicon by being confronted by them. So I, I communicate with you. You use some words I never heard before. I am, they're added in my lexicon automatically. So then when I want to speak, I, I have to pick out a word in my mental lexicon. I say, I want to use that word for my lexicon. And I can make all sorts of mistakes. I can say that I can think of pick out one word, pick out another word, uh, and so on. But it's less intention driven. Wait, so the idea is you're rejecting the idea that um, in, in those cases where you pick up those uh, terms, but you don't. Um, really know how they're used, um, right. or are somewhat ignorant about how they're used. Maybe right. maybe know some things um, that you don't. You don't even have to have the intention to be. I don't know, using it in the same way or to refer well, to the same thing that the other person is. The only intention I have to have is an internal intention. I have to intend to use a certain word in my mental lexicon. What the what the uh, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The uh, ideology of that word in my mental lexicon is, is it irrelevant to me. It is what it is, whatever it is. I don't have any intentions about that. What I intend to do is use this word for my mental lexicon. I might believe this is word I picked up from you. I might believe it's a word I picked up from someone else. But that's irrelevant. What matters is I pick out the word. Of course, I make mistakes. I can think I pick out one word and pick out another word. Uh, I might have false beliefs about where the word came from. doesn't matter. Pick out a, Whenever I pick out a word, where I choose from the lexicon, that's the word I have. But but its meaning is it's deferential only in the sense that I'm uh, assuming that it's whatever it's true of, it's true of in virtue of this chain that brings it back to the neologizing event. Uh, so the big, addition is that, the big addition is that I don't intend to use the word as you used it. I intend to use the word that's in my mental lexicon. I don't know. I don't remember who introduced me to it. Somebody introduced me to the word. I don't remember who used it. But one of the standard boring criticisms of externalism and deference was that I don't remember who taught me the word. I'm, well, that's true, obviously true. So therefore, I'm going to get rid of that altogether. Yeah, although I guess what seems unintuitive, unintuitive about this to me is that um, it seems that you could, a word could enter your lexicon in this way. You could just have no idea how other people use it, um, really have nothing in mind when you say it and just utter it, or I guess you're intending to use the word from your lexicon, whatever. And yes. it really can succeed in referring to, you know, whatever people, other people tend to. Well, then you're denying, uh, first of all, you're, you're tapping in already to the book, right? Because that's, that's what my puzzle is. Like, how can I do that at the same time as being a Gricean or something like a Gricean-like? Mm. Right? So, so you're picking out the, the main conundrum of the book, which is how do I reconcile that view with, so I'm not endorsing any of these views. I'm just saying, here's a view. Here's another view. Are these views, can they, can they possibly be compatible? If not, then what the hell is going on? Why didn't anyone notice this? Uh, if they can be, how can they be? So one of the things I'm doing is saying that one of the obstacles was to treat deference as this intentional, heavily intentional notion about the original speakers. I don't need that. All I need is that I defer to the, my lexicon. Wherever, wherever causal ancestry brought my, wherever causal ancestry brought my, brought this item to my lexicon, 
It did. That's a fact. And I'm referring, I'm deferring to the, I'm, I say, I want to use this word to pick out whatever it picks out. I don't, I don't know where it picks out, but it picks out something. Now, the question yeah. you're asking is, why would you use that word? And I say, I don't know. Ask Kripke, your partner. <laughs> you know, that's the puzzle. I mean, aren't, you know, why did you pick out a word? Why did you choose to use a word? So these guys are going to say, look, given that you choose to use the words, what do you need to know? And their answer was not much. My question is, why did you choose to use that word? You don't need to know much to use it. Why? It sounds like, you know, like why don't you choose to use Chinese words? Huh. Yeah. What I'm asking you is that here, here's, you, can, you, can, you can jump all up and down on me all you want, but I don't know. <laughs> I'm not taking a stand. I'm saying there's these two views out there. Let's get clear about what they are and then ask ourselves, are they compatible? And if they're not prima facie compatible, how can we make them compatible? And the standard way of making them compatible by was to invent a level of meaning, which was not as far as the world, right? Conceptual role, prototypes, stereotypes, something like that. Putnam, Putnam was aware of this or embraced a strong notion of analyticity as we had Higginbotham did. So people, and then also like Liz Camp, for example, live with a lot of indeterminacy. See, I think, I hear the word indeterminacy, my generation thinks the realism. Okay, indeterminacy and realism. She doesn't think that. She thinks that a lot of expressions are indeterminate and that's a good thing. I think it's a bad thing. The more indeterminacy you have, less, yeah. less, 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 less commitment to realism you have. Right. Yeah, I was just thinking because I asked um, a previous guest we had on with, was Nathan Salmon, and I asked him the, basically the same sort of question because he had this. He he effect. I'm um, not. Don't take this quote uh, too seriously because I don't remember exactly what he said, but he said something to the effect of, um, "So long as you're not trying to um, go against a sort of." linguistic norms or that you're trying to not use you're not trying to use the term in a uh, in a novel or stipulated way you just will use it in the way that um it, it it's just kind of automatically done so, it just like automatically happens that way that you uh i agree with him i, I agree that's that very easy for that i i agree that by the way he gave you a lot of room for maneuvering right when he said that doesn't violate his norms what counts yeah. as a linguistic norm that turns out to be not a simple answer so, for example, you have to know a lot of thematic role. You have to know a lot of ethnicities in order to know the, the linguistic norms. Can I can I know that someone's a bachelor without knowing that he's unmarried, or is that something I have to know a priori before I can use the word? Those issues come up in a lot of literature. Shockingly, they were not killed by Kripke and Putnam, and because they come up with people who can see who, who tend to uh, con, con, uh, make concessions to Kripke, defer to Kripke in a way. Yeah, they're still there. But that's what he said to you. He said. That's it. If I'm, I'm, if I'm not violating any norms, I use the words as, as, as their meanings determined. That's just puzzling because you say, well, wait a minute, why did you use those words, not others? Yeah, I, I definitely, I mean, it's definitely puzzling to me. I mean, maybe, maybe it's right. I mean, it's just like, I guess the intuition that I have is that for the word to, um, you know, when you use it to refer to a thing, um, to succeed in doing so, you know, you have to have what you have in mind in some way has to connect to the thing, whether it's um, directly through description or That's indirectly really cool. through um, deference in some way. But, you know, those things, the chain has to proceed from what you have in mind. Uh, that's, I agree. that's the intuition I have. But I share that intuition with you. So I think you have to say something like that stuff. I'm picking out that yeah. stuff. And you can theorize what that stuff is. That's non linguistic. That stuff is bigger right. than low and so on, whatever you my very best theory comes up. So I do agree that you have to so, so the meaning of realism is important. So one of the things I want to point out to you is that the people who I'm criticizing, the stereotypes, the the prototypes, the conceptual role people, they're not meaning realists when it comes to understanding. They think the truth conditions are completely independent of understanding, have nothing to do with understanding. I want to claim the truth conditions are there as a as a defining point, the limiting point. I can't, if I, I, you know, what I say is false or true, depending on how it maps onto the, the, the truth conditions. And then the question is, can I theorize and get closer and closer to the truth conditions? That's the goal of language. And yeah. I, I may not ever know it because skepticism is not refutable. 
Uh, but that's a different issue altogether. But what, what, what I was really fascinated by what you said, I'm not going to hold you to it. I'm not going to call him up and say, hey, no, no. this <laughs> <laughs> But I like what, uh, what you said is what he should have said, I guess, or what I expect him to say, even though I don't know what it means in some way. He said to you, according to what you said, was that, uh, oh, it picks out what it picks out. As long as I don't, and I, and I succeed in doing that, I don't violate any linguistic norms. So the point I'm trying to make is that you can be really ignorant and still make sure you don't uh, refute any linguistic norms. Or you can enrich linguistic norms, but you got to be careful. If you, if you enrich them too much, you're no longer a deferentialist, right? So there's right. limiting. So the question is, given that there's a limit to what you can put in there before you become an internalist, essentially, uh, why do you take that route at all? Now, isn't that mind-boggling that no one's answered that question? Yeah, it seems like there's a lot to still to explore on that, yeah. You would think that'd be the first question anyone asked. Now, there is the long debates about, you know, there, in the literature, there was a debate about can Kripke, how does Kripke explain Frege puzzles? You know, the puzzling Pierre was about that and so on. And Kripke's answer was nobody knows how to right. do that. Um, no, was it say Jolie, about, whatever. <laughs> it was understanding. It was, it was, it was, Putnam talks about understanding and so on. But it was very fuzzy stuff, you know, stereotypes. And in fact, Fodor and I wrote a bunch of papers in the 80s and 90s about this topic. And we didn't, we were very, we were not very sanguine about the utility of stereotypes, prototypes, conceptual role, and so on. Yeah. And in and, and response to some of those problems, uh, like we, we also had uh, Scott Soames on, and, and, and he and Simon effectively just say that, uh, yeah, the person does have contradictory beliefs. Um, but all the same, that's they're not irrational for holding them in this case. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I'm glad he said that. I wish they said this in print. I wish I would say it in print. Why don't they please? I'm begging to say it in print. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I imagine Soames has said that in print. I'm not sure exactly where, but he definitely was quite clear about that in the in the interview. Yeah. Okay. That's good to know. And I think I think Simon said something very similar. I, Maybe not quite as direct or as that. Um, okay. That's very useful. That's extremely useful. It's what I would expect them to do, but I don't think they ever did it. But now you tell me they might have done it. That'd be useful to look at you. I can check that out. It's easy enough. I wanted to say something else, kind of um, maybe a sort of pessimism about the sort of internalism, external, externalism debate, okay. which is that. Uh, so I used to be um, earlier when I started thinking about this. I. I really wanted to be an internalist. I thought that um, that there's a variety of different, I mean, everyone talks about the arguments for externalism, but I think there's some interesting arguments in favor of internalism on the other hand. And um, I used to think that uh, this is just the right way to think about it. Now I'm, now I'm like, well, um, there's just different ways to think about um, beliefs or contents and depending on which way we're thinking about them, we'd individuate them in different ways. In some ways, we want to individuate them on their like precise truth conditions or the reference maybe. Um, and in that case, the uh, criteria would involve external features, um, when, especially when there's context-sensitive expressions involved. Um, but if we don't want to individuate, individuate in, them in that way, maybe we want to in, individuate them based on um, sort of the cognitive role they play, um, uh, you know, or uh, maybe their causal role, you know, people have different views like this. Um, then it may be just internal features or maybe there's some middle ground there. Um, and depending on what we have in mind regarding meaning or content and the, how we want to individuate them determines in a way whether we're be more towards the externalist or, or internalist then. Does any of that make sense to you or... Um, that's what I've said. I'm open-minded about these things. I'm I'm not taking a stand, so to speak. I'm sort of asking a question about reconciliation. Can I reconcile these two views? And I, one of the issues that comes up, I guess you're bringing this up as well, is what are the views exactly? Right. Well, I do think I do think you got your finger on something because I do think a lot of people of your generation is skeptical about the argument for Kirby's arguments. I'm not. I thought those arguments were really convincing. So a lot of people are. are uh, sort of doubling down on Dummett's views, which I find weird. I thought Dummett was, I like Dummett's views a lot, but I think they were wrong on this topic. So I think Kripke won those debates, but it doesn't really matter if I'm right about that or not. I just want to know how to reconcile these debates with traditional theories of communication. 
you're asking me a deeper question, which is, do I think externalism is true or something like externalism? I don't know how many, that's too metaphysic for me. I don't know how many. <laughs> yeah, that's fair. I guess I am a realist. I do think there's the fact of the matter about what our words mean. I mean, that's one way out of this right away. Just go Gordy esque and say it's all, you know, it's a put up job. That, actually, on that, I made me think of um, about a few different guests and uh, about this. Um, so you say you are a realist about um, like semantic content and meaning. Well, do you have any perspectives on um, the Kripkenstein rule following argument? No, I had there's certain debates which I've avoided in my life. I don't know why. That was one of them. I had a column, column again with my colleague. He wrote on that. He wrote a book on that topic. And he taught seminars on it. I went and sat on them. I never formed any views about them. I don't know why, but it was certain topics they say. I never really had a strong view about they say. You know, I had people writing about that who were colleagues of mine. I don't know why. Certain topics just didn't turn me on enough. Yeah. They're too hard. Yeah, it, is, it is pretty hard. I, I know because um, Soames had a couple papers on it. He, he sort of was. Um, kind of critical of how the argument was even formulated in the first place. Kind of I don't know about it. I know about his papers on, um, he wrote papers on uh, uh, against two dimensionalism. Yeah, he has a book, a, a big book on um, on relating to that. Uh, that was pretty good, I thought. He's yeah. a good critic. Yeah. Um, I guess I've been still a bit optimistic that maybe some sense of. Uh, Two dimensionalism could be at least coherent and applicable. I'm probably gonna have a chance. Uh, first of all, there's 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 Stolnecker two dimensionalism and there's Chalmers two dimensionalism. I gotta get clear about that. Yeah. I'm probably closer to Stolnecker than, than, than Chalmers. But I think uh, for the purpose of my book, I'm gonna have to talk about Stol Chalmers version. And that's a way out. Right? Because he's giving you propositions which are are a priori knowable. Right. Um, so you can maybe this, about, the, about the wide content, but then be uh, be internal about the about the uh, diagonal content. Right. Yeah. That's the that's the move that um, some internalists have tried to make, or the, the you know that you can you have the diagonal proposition that's internal, and so um, that's yeah. the meaning. So, yeah. I got to um, think about that. Well, I obviously have to think about that. I can't. I don't know when I'm going to do that though. I was hoping to do it this summer, but I don't know. I slowed down. The pandemic didn't speed me up. It slowed me down. I'm good friends with this uh, novelist, Joyce Carol Oates. She lives in Princeton. And she writes like two novels a year. And she said, all this time is, is uh, paralyzing me. <laughs> <laughs> kind of paradoxical in a way. You know, too much free time. Right. Um, and actually, actually, this is another sort of maybe too metaphysical of a question, but... Uh, do you have a view on what sort of uh, propositions are in the first place? Are there, you know, do you no, that's propositions? Of, that's Jeff King. <laughs> Talk to Jeff King. Hey, he thinks they have to be structured. I do find it amusing that, you know, Stolnick comes up with this theoretical notion of a proposition as a function from worlds of truth values. And all of a sudden, that engineering solution creates problems. You get a whole industry of people trying to solve the engineering problems, which are really a reflection of the formalism that he chose to use. It's nothing to do with our propositions per se, but it's the formalism. I find that puzzling, that there's like an industry of people worrying about problems that are really a creation of the formalism, nothing to do with the, the problem that is originally conceived of. So the structure, yeah. I do find the structure of proposition view of Soames and King and... Um, what's it Speaks. Called? Speaks, and there's also a guy from Minnesota, Peter Hanks. I find that weird. That the Psalms is usually like the most clear-headed person I know. When he talks about these, uh, about the, the, the what do they call it, the, the uh, unity of the proposition mm -hmm. solution, it gets dark. It gets really dark fast. I think Jesus. <laughs> when I moved to France, what? How did this happen? I did find because uh, they have that. I think it's a uh, Psalms. Speaks King and Speaks have that, that that book on called New Thinking about Propositions, yeah. and some of the ideas there are, are quite interesting. Where they they're thinking about propositions as a sort of yeah, um, I think Jeff King was the original. Way. Yeah. 
I think Jack King was the original person for this. I think he started this debate. Yeah. Because, I mean, how, how serious of a concern do you think this is that often in, in philosophy there's these um, things just taken for granted in, like, philosophical theorizing and, you know, the philosophy can progress for hundreds of years without asking those questions about, well, what about those things we took for granted? What be well, that's how I felt about, and, that's how I was telling you I felt about the words debate, and that's how I feel about the um, about this debate I'm talking about uh, deference and, and understanding. Things have been taken for granted. So I don't know. Well, the, the Hasslinger stuff. If you read the stuff on amelioration that she writes about, you just think, wow, wow, how, why does she think she can say that? I don't know if you know, remember, the, I don't know how well she knows this debate or not, but she talks about, and Ludlow does too as well, they talk about concepts remaining the same concept but changing their content. So basically she argues that what happens, but she, someone says, no, wait a minute, you can't possibly think that we negotiate the meaning of the word marriage, but does it have influence on these other words in other languages that are synonyms with the translations of marriage? She says, oh, no, it's not really about the words, it's about the concepts. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, what I think is that the concept changes its content. So there's a concept of marriage before single-sex marriages were permissible. Now it's a new concept of marriage, which allows single-sex marriages. And you say, what, what do you mean? So the concept remains the constant, but the con its content change. And you say, that's incoherent. You, know, you can't possibly think that. And she said, yeah, I think that. And you just think, wow, there's a literature that says concepts are not individuated by their contents. It's, you don't even know where, it, it takes your breath away. You just think like, how do I even begin to answer that? Because I, I would take it to be the standard view that in some way the concept, I don't know, supervenes on various contents or something like that. Like you can't yeah, but if, if it doesn't supervene on contents, what does it, she thinks that the, the role the, the, the role or the, 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 the role that a concept plays in our lives is independent of its content. You think, okay, well, what, what fixes that uh, role? What fixes that role? It must be the content that fixes the role. If it's not the content, how's it, you can't, and by the way, you don't have like, like with words, you have you have the word there. You can only say it's the expression. You don't have anything like that with concepts. Yeah, I don't know some some mental state or something or some state of the brain. Maybe that seems weird. So. Yes, it's a mess. All I'm saying is that what I find out in a lot of the applied philosophy literature makes this is a good, this is a good fertile ground for your research. A lot of the applied philosophy literature makes assumptions that are foundational. They just assume are prevalent that everybody holds these things, and they don't. So you should always look underneath the surface for what what's driving this engine. And I could I looked really hard at this um, amelioration literature. I realized at some point they really needed this idea that concepts can change their contents, remain constant. You think that's because you know, one of the things you have to explain is like so. For example, here's something that you can't explain on on their account. Uh, marriage used to uh, exclude same sex, but now it doesn't. That's incoherent, because on the, on the old meaning of word, it, it doesn't make any sense. On the current meaning of word, it's obviously true. So what? So what's? And word, virtual word is it the same concept? <laughs> yeah, concept. <laughs> yeah. So the idea is that the you can't say it. You can't. You want to say you can't say. You want to use the old and the new concepts, but you can't use them both. One or the other. Also, it seems it seems to. Going back to something we talked about earlier, it almost seems to allow for concepts to be too malleable. <laughs> the same exactly. concept can change so much that it's like yeah. the content's completely different, and so, but it's yeah. still the same concept. It yeah. Seems weird to say. yeah, and you say, well, it has to be remain the same. And you, it turns out what has to remain the same is so minimal that there's no difference between the concept of a planet and the concept of uh, marriage, let's say. <laughs> <You know>? right. <laughs> so long as it, I don't know, satisfies some other relation <laughs> about conceptual role or whatever. But you don't think, one of the things that happens in applied philosophy is you don't think of looking under the hood. You got to look under the hood. You think, well, this is too large a question. This is a, this is a, par this is a paper about marriage. I'm not going to look under the hood. You got to look under the hood. <laughs> right. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. I mean, there's some room for kind of leaving those questions to other, um, for others to write about um, or to write about at some other time. Um, but um, it you run... <laughs> it's pretty. It's it's in a way risky to to never look at those, uh, never look under the hood. I agree. Um, right, and so um, this book that you're working on, or, or that's coming out in a bit on uh, communication, you've talked about some of that a bit. Well, what more would we sort of expect to see in the 
in the content of that book? Well, the books are divided into two halves. The first half is supposed to be just laying out the the, the conflict. Like here's what what Putnam and Put Kripke and those the guys think, and Evans and so on. That's a defense of deference. Not defense of it, just an articulation of deference, what deference means. So so it's supposed to be slightly creative because it's telling you that here's something that deference could have been, they could have meant this by deference and they would have had less trouble um, than they had. So that's uh, so that the first half of the book is about deference and 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 what and Grace's views are about communication. The second half of the book is to ask yourself, well, how do you put these together? I mean, it's supposed to be just sort of straightforward that you can't really know the meanings of these words according to the deference view. You don't need to know the meanings of words. So what do you need to know? You, we use language to get things that we want done. Like I ask you for a glass of water, you give me a glass of water. Why do I chose those words? And why did you know what, what to get me when you heard the words that I chose? Especially since neither you nor I know the meaning of the word water. We don't know the meaning of the word water. Somebody else knows the meaning of water. Some chemist knows the meaning of the word water. So the question is, well, maybe I don't need to know the meaning. Maybe I need to know something less than the meaning. That's like the 1980s, 1990s, going through that literature. Two-dimensionalism, stereotype views, conceptual role views, and so on. And then uh, the last part of the book is basically offering a positive view, which starts off with the assumption that meaning realism is true. So I want truth conditional meaning in there. And then and that when we speak, we, we aspire to get as close to truth conditions as we can. And then there's a lot of theorizing, but it's not linguistic. I gotta leave it fuzzy like that because I don't it's too it's it's not it's not complete. So the last third of the book is not written yet. Right, fair enough. And even if you um but that that stuff you intend to intend to cover, you so. Yeah, I intend to cover. The big part is that the boss my big question is the criticisms are straightforward. Mostly they have to do with compositionality. These things don't compose. But a lot of other criticisms are at play as well. That's all news that they don't compose. The big part of the book, the, the most creative part of the book, is going to be uh, what what is what what is what does one have to know in order to communicate? What's the least one can know in order to communicate? What are we doing when we communicate? We're not grasping meanings. What are we grasping? Yeah, the answer, we are grasping meanings. We're getting them piece by. So you know, one thing, one way to think about this is the following: I said, what's the meaning of um, of uh, flies? Oh, it's the meaning of flies. Is the meaning of flies? I certainly give you the meaning of flies when I say that. It's very minimal. I haven't told you much. It's not very useful. The question is, you know, what counts as giving you the meaning of something? What counts as giving you an informed meaning of something? And that's what I'm working on right now, is how to give you informed access and descriptions of what you know when you know a language, which doesn't violate any of the, the stuff on deference. What do I have to do to get that? Yeah. Well, yeah one thing is, the meaning realist thinks meanings are out there, right? They're not inside the head, they're outside the head. So the meanings are out there somewhere in the world. And the question is, well, if they're out there, I can explore them. But I'm not doing semantics. I'm no longer involved in an a priori enterprise. I'm no longer trying to, to do something that's an internalist in that respect. It's an investigation of some sort. Yeah, it's an investigation. So I think me, uh, communication is an investigation in some way or other. But that's all very fuzzy and dark, and don't quote me on it. I'll get back to you in a couple of months, and we'll talk about it again. So yeah, sounds good. And on, on that, like, because um, we had um, another guest, Kim Sterelny, and, and one thing he's uh, worked on a bunch is um, exploring accounts of language that can fit into sort of a gradual evolution of language. And I was just wondering if, if anything like the um, how language develops or the, the history of it is something you you think about or um, well, I have you consider when thinking about like a plausible account of these sorts. Of I knew his, I knew him. I was good friends with him when we were earlier on in my career, and I knew when he was writing with straight philosophy. He and Debbie used to write a lot of philosophy language together. I haven't kept up with the philosophy biology. One of my students is over there. My, one of my students has a postdoc with him, working on philosophy biology. He's kind of the guy in philosophy biology right now, but I haven't kept up with that. So I don't know. I, mean, I assume he's being influenced by Milliken. I know he was a big fan of Milliken. So was Peter Godfrey Smith. But I haven't really kept up with that literature. It's sort of theological semantics. Right. Yeah, because part of the idea is like, some sometimes I worry that when we say things about um, language or meaning and so forth, we're drawing conclusions based on just I don't know language languages with which we're acquainted, like fully developed complex languages. And I wonder. I mean, 
are we over general are we kind of um, generalizing these what we learn about our languages to all language or meaning altogether? together what about these more simple or less developed um, languages or thoughts that, that creatures could have um, that might not fit the mold of um, you know well, yeah. I'm not going to say anything off my head about it, but I think I'm yeah, nervous. <laughs> I'm pooping out. Let me stop. <laughs> that no, sounds good. Yeah, you've, uh, we've been we do an hour for almost two hours. Up. We do. Oh my God, that's the most I've ever talked in my life. I think. <laughs> no, it's been excellent. It's been yeah, it's been really excellent to have you on yeah. and uh, to Thank take a question.